Kicking us off this evening is Bike New York's president and CEO, Ken Podziba. Thank you, Devin. Hello, everyone. This evening, we're honored to host three women whose vision and leadership are changing the game and paving the way for a more inclusive community. According to the New York Times, this past July, our city saw an 80% increase in cycling trips compared with July 2019, with women's ridership rising an astonishing 147%. But to make this increase permanent past the pandemic, one key factor is the representation and visibility of female riders. Tonight's guests come from different backgrounds across the cycling and transportation spheres, but they're united in their effort to close the gender gap for good. Now let's get started. Over to our host for the evening, Sharon and Chantal. Thank you so much, Ken. I really appreciate it. And welcome to everyone. Our theme for this evening, our spoke series theme for this evening is cycling, how women make it work. I have the pleasure of being joined by my colleague and also uh, co-host, co-moderator, Chantal Hardy, who is the event and volunteer manager at Bike New York. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, closing the gender gap in cycling is a really important topic near and dear to my heart, and I'm really happy to be part of this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really happy that you're joining us, Chantal. And also, um, I have the honor and um, just, I'm just really thrilled that we have three phenomenal women, uh, phenomenal guests. And they are Angela Azolino, who is the executive director at Get Women's Cycling and also Lisa Gillespie, who is the Shiro of Black Girls Do Bike, and also Caroline Sampanero, who is the head of mobility and transit po uh, policy at Lyft City Bike. Yay, thank you, thank you, thank you for welcome joining Welcome everybody. Us. Yeah, welcome. Um, you know what, I thought we would start off uh, with a New York Times article. And um, the article, uh, I'm going to quote the article. In cities, but perhaps notably in New York City, growth has been driven by the surge of the number of women who took to bicycling after lockdown orders uh, it eliminated the main barrier to biking. And that is safe streets. It was less traffic and, and as a result, safer streets and more women started biking. Now that uh, we, we have this uptick in cycling, I'm hoping, uh, and we'll start with you, Caroline, can you share with us how your work contributes to making women feel safer and more confident while cycling in an urban environment? Thanks, uh, Sharon, Chantal, Ken, John, everyone at Bike New York for having me. And thank you, Lisa and, and Angela. It's so nice to, to be on a panel with both of you, Shiro's rock stars. Um, that's a great question. I think you you called out the first most important point, which um, study after study shows that all people, regardless of race, age, ability, um, look to safety as a key decision making factor on whether they're going to try a bike ride. And so the work that um, the city of New York has done alongside our work with City Bike has been really critical um, to encouraging people to give City Bike a try. Um, I'd like to note that um, our general manager, Laura Fox, um, also a rock star, when she took over the city bike program, 20% uh, of her leadership team were women. And she made a concerted effort um, since she's taken over the, the leadership role and now 90% of her leadership team are women. And so she's going out of her way to build the perspective of women into the work we do at the city bike program. Um, I'd also like to just draw attention to the Critical Worker Program. It's a program that we provided to critical workers um, at the onset of the pandemic to provide free city bike memberships. Um, we did this in partnership with the city of New York and with our sponsors, uh, City and MasterCard. 
Um, I think historically, like 35% of our ridership, 39% of our active city bike riders are women. Um, in the last year, 49% of new city bike riders have been women. So I think that tracks with your comment, Sharon. Um, what's really interesting is of the 30 some odd, um, 33,000 um, folks that took advantage of the critical worker program, the free membership, 20,000 of those were women. So 61% of the overall participation was women in that, in that program. Um, and you know that, that better reflects probably the percentage of critical workers that are women, which I think makes us very proud that we were able to deliver a service that provided real value to New Yorkers at a time of crisis. Um, and in doing that, I think we saw um, parity in ways that we, you know, we strive for. So, you know, safety on the street, bike lanes, protected ones, I think are drawing um, parity in terms of the New York City public that is drawn to city bike overall. And then we work really hard to think about uh, the perspective of leadership that we bring um, in the program. And then we try to offer programs that really meet the need of women as well. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, you know what, I wanna know, what, I don't know, this can be a, a difficult question, but what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do you think that the, I, I know that you, you mentioned and we're talking about the pandemic, but do you think that the uptick, especially with women using cycling, has to do with the fact that uh, the, the person that heads a city bike started off with a, a solid female team in place? No, I tend to think that, I, I don't know, maybe it's my, my background in advocacy before joining Lyft. I was at Transportation Alternatives for many years. Um, and I think there's probably not a silver bullet on this. You know, I think, um, you know, when I was a young advocate at, at TA, when the city of New York um, and, and John Orcutt uh, being there at the time started rolling out protected bike lanes and it was a sort of a controversial idea in this, it's hard to imagine now, it was very controversial that there were protected bike lanes going down on major avenues in, in New York. And in order to sort of demonstrate uh, basic rationale for doing that, we went out and did a quick survey on the street. We counted um, just with our eyes. So, you know, flawed inherently, but we, we did a gender count of riders we saw on the street. And we did a, a count on 7th Avenue, which had no bike lane at the time, 6th Avenue, which had a painted bike lane at the time, and then 2nd Avenue, the new protected bike lane at the time. And what we saw was that we saw double, more than double the number of women on 2nd Avenue riding in the bike lane than we did on 7th Avenue. 6th Avenue was somewhere in the middle. And so I think what that speaks to, you know, there's been, there've been a lot of studies on this and I, I actually think it's worth, worth noting um, the Better Bike Share Partnership um, did their own research and, you know, 40, 48% of all the people that took the study cited safety as a reason. Um, I think, I, I'm not saying women are weaker <laughs> by any stretch, right? I, I don't think that but I think that statistically other research, for example, a study out of Uni University of Minnesota in 2019 showed that statistically women were about three times more likely to face encroachments by motorists. So, um, you know, there, there is a reason, probably many reasons, right? Why people may feel safer once bike lanes are built. But, but again, to your point, Sharon, it's not just the infrastructure on the ground, right? Um, people have a whole host of reasons why they do and don't, do not uh, do certain things. And so as we try to appeal to more and more people overall at the program, it's important that we're bringing the perspective of diverse group of New Yorkers to the table um, uh, at City Bike to make sure that the program is serving um, everyone in, in the city. Okay, uh, Lisa or Angela, um, how are you making, how, how is, for example, Black girls do bike? How, how are they making it safer? How are their rides making it safer for uh, Black women to, to want to join? Angela, it's nice to meet you. And for some reason, Carolyn, I think I, I, I either did a ride with you or something before because you, you look really familiar. Um, but in terms of what Black girls uh, in terms of what we do for our membership, in terms of safety, is a lot of education. Um, with each ride, 
you know, pre-ride, we provide education, but on an ongoing basis, um, in terms of training, we do a lot of training with our members, whether or not it's learning how to gear shift, learning how to ride in the line, um, learning how to use hand signals and verbal signals, depending on the rides that we're doing, is something that we're teaching our riders. And you're right, not every rider feels safe riding on the streets, and yet they want to. So we do take our riders out on the streets for some of our rides, instructing them how to ride, the importance of stopping at red lights, um, the importance of being aware of your surroundings. Um, and that's just an ongoing process for, for all of our members. Um, and our rides range from anywhere within the five boroughs to out, out in Jersey. Uh, we'll be doing further rides upstate. We have big centuries planned and, and other rides as well. Uh, but safety is always paramount. And, and for us, it became, um, it, it, it became important at one point, especially during the start of BLM, to ride in numbers because there was an issue of not only being unsafe as cyclists in general, but unsafe as black cyclists. Um, and through that, we found even more unity. And through that, we gained even more members. Um, and our membership is constantly growing. Just, just to give you a couple of statistics about the group, uh, Black Girls Who Bike is actually an international group. We have more than 25,000 members. In New York City, we have more than 1,500 members. We're growing every day. And we have riders that range from the mom who rides with her kid on the back to, um, to iron women and professional um, cyclists who are competitive. So we have everybody within the group in New York and you know we try to take everyone into account when we do various kinds of rides. So Get Women Cycling, and Caroline, you know this, uh, back in 2016, started a curriculum or outreach to local driving schools because we really wanted to go inside and talk to the, the people behind the wheels of, of cars that, um, that, well, basically the city was built around cars, right? It's very car-centric. It's been a mono uh, modality for the last 100 plus years and now in a matter of 10 years, we're starting to see more bikes, more scooters, more mopeds, <clears throat> personal mobile devices, you know, you, you know, you name it, along with the number of people who are, um, who have been walking. So <clears throat> an increase in the number of people walking. So while we have a phenomenal, um, the, you know, the city of New York, as Caroline said, uh, has been working really hard to redesign our streets to make the streets uh, for people and, and less for cars as they had been designed previously. The, unfortunately, uh, the institutions uh, up, up in Albany uh, that dictate how uh, people behind the wheel gets educated, it hasn't evolved. So um, there's the disconnect, you know, you, you can have a bike lane on a street, but we all know that folks don't necessarily know what to do with that bike lane, how to behave, why is it there, um, where we buy our bikes uh, is still, if you think about the big box stores like Kmart and Walmart, where are they positioned in the store is with camping and recreation. It's not thought of as, as a, a viable mobility vehicle, which by state law it is, so there's, um, there's a really big chasm between, you know, what, what the law is and how people view bicycles and then the education that's given to the people who are driving multi-ton cars, you know, and I don't really blame them for being confused and not know, knowing. So uh, I can talk about this for hours, but Get Women Cycling for the, for the last six years now has been in these driving schools, ha has been uh, formed relationships with local driving schools. Uh, I've personally been in front of over 3,000 uh, motorists and the response has been incredible. And so I want you all to know out there, whether you're in New York City or elsewhere, um, that uh, education at the root uh, of, the, of the problem is, is really needed. And guess what? It's also really welcomed. Um, so that's been a huge, huge help. And, I, I, and I'd like you all to know that you can feel confident um, 
uh, that there's that there's people out there like going into these schools. Um, we even became certified to teach defensive driving so that we can actually go in and teach a full six hour class to motorists. Finally, uh, more recently, we have cre created a defensive riding, so defensive bike riding course, uh, which mimics a lot of what the motorists are taught. So we now have the same language that's being taught. And uh, if you come to one of the Get Women Cycling defensive riding classes, you'll learn a lot about defensive techniques that the motorists know. And, and I feel like that's really powerful and that uh, the audience could feel really confident knowing that that information is, is out there for you um, to take and hold on to. Um, I'm loving what I'm hearing. Uh, I think it's really important, the intersection of infrastructure, the equipment, right, from city bikes. Um, not everybody has access to either a bike or storage. Um, and also education, whether it's education, um, like Lisa's doing and Angela with both the riders, um, and uh, with the cars, which I th think is ingenious, and also the work that Bike New York is doing. Um, uh, I think many of you, uh, of you do know that Bike New York also does uh, uh, bike education. So from learn to ride to street skills, um, there's also safety in numbers um, and there's safety in education. Um, but definitely the pandemic has sort of seen this surge in folks biking, especially women. How do we maintain that momentum as things start to open up Fingers crossed, everybody, as the as we see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, how do we keep that? How how do we build on that momentum that we're seeing? How like what actions will make these changes sustainable in the long term? Um, Lisa, why don't you get us started? What are your thoughts on that? Well, my main thought is visibility. I'm when I think of the numbers that we have nationwide, and how I'll go into certain places and you know bike places, bike shops, or bike groups, and they don't even know who we are. I can't tell you how many times um, over the past season when we were doing longer rides, there would be a group of us together, and people would be asking us who we were. Um, I'm trying to get our group to the point where when they see a group of Black women together cycling, they can hopefully assume, oh, maybe those are Black girls who bike because we do have so many members. Our breast cancer ride when we did it, because we were limited due to COVID, was, was capped at 50, but I had, I had almost twice that that wanted to attend. But, you know, we follow social distancing um, laws and um, we wear masks and, you know, safety is always paramount, which was something else that came into effect with the pandemic. Um, but visibility is key. And the more of us that not only ride together as a group, but ride with other groups increases our visibility. You know, members are encouraged to join multiple groups. Many of us are, are, neighbor, are, are members of other groups like Major Taylor, like New York Cycling Club, like Five Borough Bike Club, like uh, the Good Bike Club. So Major Taylor, New Jersey, um, just so that we, we get out and about and not only are we seeing more, uh, but we're also gonna be able to gain more knowledge and bring it back to the group because the group is about teaching each other. The group is about helping women who, who share the joy of cycling, but especially black women and black girls who share the joy of cycling because we're often marginalized. We're, we're often not seen as strong cyclists, which many of them are but anyone who wants to do any kind of cycling, whether or not it's you wanna to get together with your friends and go for a ride in the park, or you wanna train for an event, we have somebody who can help either guide you in the, that direction or else actively train with you. So we encompass everybody. And through seeing us in parks, through seeing us in various areas, through seeing us on 9W, um, we're hoping that we become more visible. But that being said, um, being visible also, in a way, puts a little bit of a target on our back. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, um, riding this summer in parts of New Jersey, where, you know, with, with different groups where, you know, we, we didn't have anything thrown at us except for words, but it's a real issue that we face. And, um, I'm hoping that becoming more visible 
will help deal with that issue because then they'll know that this is a group and this is a large group. Yeah, so the idea of that of visibility, but also of partnering, partnering with other groups as well, because there's safety in numbers, um, mm -hmm. but there's also the more visible you are, um, you know, the better it is for everybody. Um, that's fantastic, Lisa. Caroline, earlier I, I heard, I, I saw you nodding your head when, when I was posing the question, how are we going to build on this momentum? So I wanted to give you an opportunity to address that. Yeah, I, I think... Um... There, there have been silver linings in a, in a terrible time. And I think the open streets that we saw launch, the networks of open streets launch across the world and cities around the world um, played a part in getting more people to bike daily, um, you know, for recreation. We saw an uptick in what we call joy rides, people taking a city bike out from one station and returning it to the same station. So not necessarily commuting, but just getting outside and getting some fresh air. Um, it's easy to forget, I think, often in our day-to-day -day lives that we have built the, like we've spent a century building our day-to-day -day life around the automobile in this country. Um, we, we have a system of a commuter tax benefit system where you can use your pre-tax dollars from your employer uh, to pay for parking for your single occupancy vehicle. It's not surprising with the streets built the way they are and those incentives baked into federal funds that 76.4% of Americans drive alone in their car to work every day. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen this sort of harrowing uh, specter of people returning to single occupancy vehicle trips in cities because they're afraid of transit, because they're scared that traffic's picking back up. Um, and so one of the things we're really focused on at City Bike is, is um, supporting an effort at the, in, in Congress to expand the scope of the commuter tax benefit program um, and to allow people, instead of choosing parking with their pre-tax dollars, to choose uh, bike share membership as part of what they put those dollars towards. I think that's the kind of structural change that makes a real difference in people's day-to-day -day lives. If you can make it make sense for your wallet um, and make you think about it at a structural level, we really do open up the possibility for people to think about the bike as something that they can do to commute. Um, to put that in perspective, like, you know, city bike... Um, just became the largest docked bike share system in the world outside of China. We're really close actually to beating the largest system in China and we don't, we don't have long to go. Um, but in, in the context of what that actually means in the city of New York, we take up 0.5% of all curb space. Um, compared to a vehicle, we, we are empowering 27 uh, trips in that one car parking spot a day as compared to a, a car parking spot, which is more like two trips a day. Cars sit parked 95% of the time. This is an equity issue, a space issue. Most, most New Yorkers don't own cars. They don't drive cars. They don't use cars. And yet we've turned over the curb to people who own a car and want to store their car largely for free. So I think it, it does boil down to leadership at a, at a, at a level that's more structural. And so that's one of the ways that we're leaning into something that's happening nationally to try and make the point. Um, and I think that can make a big difference. I think that is a fantastic point um, because I hadn't really thought about it that way that, um, you know, the same things that are driving, driving, <laughs> um, that are bringing people to riding um, two wheeled vehicles may also be enticing people back into four wheeled vehicles. Um, so that also makes sense, Angela, with the work you're doing with the education while um, we're all sort of advocating maybe for less car culture and, and, and more riding culture. Um, but Angela, what, what, are, what do you have to say on this topic of um, post-pandemic? What can we do to keep the, keep the wheels turning? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree uh, with what Lisa was, was talking about, you know, visibility, continuing to ride. And of course, what Caroline was mentioning um, about you know, the power of government, local government. So I think I, I would I would say, and, you know, on a dime, we were closing streets and occupying spaces where cars were in, in, in a second, you know, I mean, not literally in a second, but very quick turnaround. And I would just say that the, the pandemic has opened our eyes, ours in general, as to uh, how we can re-envision re our streets. Um, and it's been for a while, you know, that's the other gift about it. It's like a year now. 
Uh, and so um, now the city is even saying that they're going to continue with the open streets. So the restaurants are still going to keep with their um, occupying curb space. So, but uh, it could end too. We have a new administration coming in and, and we don't know what that's going to be like. So I would say to keep the momentum going that um, folks should really get involved as much as possible in a local politics, advocate uh, for what it is that it is meaningful to you, participate in your local uh, community boards when you can. Time is an issue. I know everyone is stressed. There's still a, a large number of people on unemployment. There's families, there's lots to uh, deal with. So if you don't have the time, then find um, a, a, an organization that, that does act, um, advocate for what is important to you and support them and join their email list so that you can be looped in the conversation and, and make a difference. Because the people, as we have seen, especially again during this year, the voice of the people and the action of the people is, is really powerful at the grassroots level. And we need, we need to continue to encourage that. Angela, that is so perfect because I think that kicks it over to Sharon's next question. You just set yeah, this up perfectly was, for us. Like it was scripted. Amazing. Exactly. Uh, a, a great segue, as a matter of fact. Um, really wanted to uh, turn the camera, if you will, onto our audience. And I'd like to um, ask the three of you, how is it that uh, our audience and, and people who are listening to this conversation, how can they uh, not only support, uh, support more women cycling um, generally, but support um, each, of, each of your efforts to get women cycling, to get more women cycling? Yeah, you know, get involved, get involved, get involved. Uh, educate if you are, currently riding your bicycle, whether it's for commuting, recreational, for distance racing, mountain biking, you know, whatever the genre, if you're riding your bicycle, continue to ride your bicycle as much as possible. As Lisa said, and I know Caroline knows, you know, representation matters, visibility matters. You are the role model for people who are second guessing. You know, every time you ride by, there's eyes looking at you and you have to believe that you are the role model. They see you and, and, and perhaps hope to aspire to what you're doing. So please do that. If you um, are hesitant, uh, but you really have the desire to do so, know that there is an abundant amount of resources, Bike New York's education courses, uh, the Mechanical Gardens, which is a bike co-op here in New York City, the uh, Black Girls Do Bike, Brown Black Girl, I mean, Brown Bike Girl. I mean, there's just so, so many organizations out there. City Bike is expanding. Th thank you for coming to Sunset Park, Caroline. <laughs> we have them here. Um, they're going up into, uh, I think, the Bronx. So there's lots of opportunities. If you have a problem, if you're hesitant, don't... Uh, be shy, you know, reach out. Um, everyone here is really happy to help and, and we're here for you. So I think that's important for Get Women Cycling uh, in particular. Um, if you like what you're hearing, uh, please follow us on social media. Uh, we do not only education for um, safety with regard to automobiles and, and bikes, but also we do repair sessions so that we empower you to understand the basic issues that come up with your bicycle, how to repair them, what the lexicon is. So if you don't want to repair them, you could at least feel empowered going to a bike shop and saying, I know this is an issue with my bike. Here it is. This is what it is. We also spotlight female mechanics. Um, so again, representation matters. I'm a mechanic and I have a colleague that's there and we invite female mechanics from across the world. So Pat, any of the audience, if you're a mechanic, please reach out to us because we want to spotlight you on our Ask a Wrench series. Um, so support us, uh, participate. And I think maybe even more important, give us feedback. You know, if something's not right, if, you, if, if something rubbed you the wrong way or, or we didn't get it right, or if, you know, or if we're doing the right thing, you know, whatever it is, we really do encourage feedback um, and, and hold on to it because, you know, you mean a lot to us and we want, every, we want you to be successful and happy, so. 
Thank you. Um, Lisa? Well, um, from my point of view, I'm an active recruiter. Every woman, every, every black woman or woman of color I see on a bike that I don't know, I want to know, and I want to invite them to the group. Um, I have members that have invited other people to the group. I asked my uh, male fellow cyclists to invite people to the group. Um, it's, it's a unique space. So it, it's important for it to grow. But then again, you know, we collaborate with other groups, which still helps us to grow in general. Um, I think the more that we reach out and the more that we become involved with each other, the bigger our community and our web grows and the more safe uh, cycling becomes for all of us. Um, so I would just encourage anyone who is a cyclist or who wants to be a cyclist, you know, to reach out and to join any, any number of us, any group in general, just to increase our numbers on the street. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that there are resources out there for women and there are safe spaces for them because that's one thing that I've heard from from, um, from some people regarding some groups, it's like they they didn't feel, you know, like their needs were taken into account as them. And I feel that, you know, as women of color, we, we do have a different perspective. Um, there has been a certain amount of marginalization and um, it, it's overcoming those stereotypes, but knowing that the stereotypes are there as an ally, can help overcome them and can help make a stronger cycling community. So awareness as well. Okay, Caroline. Yeah, I've, I got involved in, in this work as a young uh, college student and, and I started doing critical mass bike rides. Uh, so what Lisa and uh, Angela have been saying about community and building community really resonates for me. I think it, um, it is what originally drew me to, to spend so much time thinking about bikes to begin with. I know nothing about them from like a technical perspective. Um, so I guess I would, I'll build on that and, um, and say that I was, I was struck as a young advocate at transportation alternatives um, by the community board process. Um, I was turning out to community board meetings and supporting the idea of bike lanes. And I, I witnessed how, how quickly like some of those ideas were just kind of voted down because someone who was coming to complain about their parking spot spoke up at the meeting. And so I've always been inspired by the power of organizing. I think that um, our civic process in New York and, and really wherever you live is only as healthy as is the participation of the community in that process itself. So there's no better time really with a mayoral election and um, you know, three quarters of the city council turning over in, in New York uh, this fall for, for people that care enough to be on this panel tonight um, to get involved, you know, to show up to a community meeting that maybe you've never been to, to think about um, sort of sharing your point of view about how streets can be used differently, how space could be all allocated more equitably um, in those meetings, because I think that perspective is really what helps shape the outcome. Um, and we all have agency in that. We're lucky to live in a system where there are these meetings and these forums and these opportunities, um, but it's on us to show up and to be a part of that. So, um, you know, I, th I think the work that Angela and Lisa are doing locally is just, is really powerful. I think City Bike, I think is this awesome tool for New Yorkers. It's, um, it's available to anyone where we provide the service and we're expanding the service and, and we're really happy to be doing that. Um, but it's utilitarian in the way that you're, your, your bus ride or your transit ride can be. Um, and so we, we, we like that we add that alongside the beauty of group bike rides and all the, the community that we have um, around biking in New York. Um, but, but civic engagement is really critical right now more than ever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'd like to uh, return to that, but I wanted to follow up on uh, something that Lisa had mentioned earlier when, um, when uh, black girls do bike, uh, bikes do certain areas and um, they, they're the recipient of um, some uh, off the cuff language, if you will. 
Um, it got me thinking when each of you are cycling by yourselves, um, what's the one uh, safety tip that you can give someone who is, you know what, I'm, I'm just gonna get on the bike and ride. Um, and uh, she's, a, she's a woman. And uh, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts in terms of safety from that perspective overall? First First thing is, if you're going to be riding alone, please tell somebody where you're riding, what your route is, what your approximate time is, you know, so they can, uh, so they know. We also use tools like Strava, where you can actually send a beacon where your ride starts, and they can actively track you. So that's one thing. And I do have riders who love to ride, one in particular, she loves to ride 100 mile rides, and I love her. But I'm always concerned because she's single and she's riding alone on at these great distances. She's a strong rider, but you know, especially um, over the summer when uh, pensions um, were really strong, it, it was very concerning, and it became very concerning for all of us. And um, that only encouraged us more to ride together. Um, also, plan your rides. You know, make sure you're riding in an area where you feel safe. If you're going to be scouting a new area, do it with several people so that way you're not alone. Um, you know, everybody is their own rider. Everybody is their own cyclist. Um, and even though I may encourage safety, not everyone will follow it. Uh, but the bottom line is that people should always know where you're going, have an idea of your ride time. You should have um, your, your cell phone charger, an additional charger. You should have your tool bag for any kind of incidents that may occur, flat, uh, flat repair kit, CO2 pump or pump, um, and possibly a little first aid kit. Um, a lot of riders also wear ID bands on their wrists so that way if there is an issue, they could be, uh, they, they could be easily identified. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can maintain our, our safety. Mm -hmm. Any additional tips, uh, Angela or Caroline? I would, um, if you're riding in, in a city environment, um, what I like to do is always, 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 every time I'm stopped at a red light or a stop sign, um, turn around, look at the, look at the motorist behind you, wave, smile, ask them how they're doing, uh, you know, just some form of communication to let uh, them know that you are here, sometimes depending on how long we're out. You, you know, that's the thing with a bicycle, you know, we don't have like a, a flick of a switch where we can turn our lights on if we didn't think we were going to be out riding until eight o'clock at night and we didn't bring our lights. We're kind of like in a situation. So uh, you always want to make sure that uh, be aware of your surroundings always and just like, you know, just let, you know, put some good energy out there and let people know that I'm here, I'm alive, I like you, it's a beautiful day, let's be happy. Um, that actually really works a lot, I, I find. In situations that are um, where there are no people, it's really, it could be really desolate. I found myself riding in Staten Island in an area I didn't know. It was dark out. There was nobody around. I didn't feel comfortable about it. It was an intersection. And, you know, I, I really do my best to abide by the law. Um, but I wasn't waiting for the light to change. You know, <laughs> I was just like, I got to go. Um, and I got it. And all, all the while, just keep scanning for where's the where's the phone, where's the subway stop, where's, where's the deli. So if an incident could occur, you can go back and reach out. So those are those are my two top tips. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of, of talking to drivers. <laughs> uh, it, it, it definitely is, is something that's very, I mean, you know, they look, out, they look out after you as well. You know, I mean, it's just it's another important. person on the road. So yeah, I mean, and you need to make that eye contact with the drivers. So yeah, I was gonna say that, you know, because so many times, you know, you'll wave your hand, you'll say something, they're not paying attention. It's like you have to catch your eye. So that way they acknowledge you.
Um, and um, following up, Caroline, about the power of organizing. Uh, it, I mean, we're you alluded to the fact that we're at this watershed moment, and this is this is for everybody. I mean, what 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 should we be doing now when we we have all of this that that's happening in terms of the electoral uh, process at this point in time in New York? Yeah, I think those personal connections that we can each make with with people that are putting together their their platforms and talking about the policies to gauge interest in the public and, and get a sense for how um, the electorate may respond. It, like we all have the power to make those personal connections and to tell our personal stories. Um, some of the most important work I've ever been a part of um, was the formation of Families for Safe Streets during the last mayoral um, election when um, de Blasio was a candidate running for the first time. Um, and we brought uh, to all the candidates the idea of Vision Zero. Um, and you know, I, as an organizer, didn't bring it, but uh, families who had lost loved ones in traffic crashes did. Um, and you know, it was compelling to the candidates to hear from people about their personal experiences of traffic violence um, and of what it would mean to do something different than the status quo. And it wasn't surprising that, you know, newly elected Mayor de Blasio at the time stood with those family members when he announced that policy and he had made that personal connection to those families. And so I think in our own ways, we all have our own networks. We have ways that, um, you know, communities we're a part of and we can bring the power of those communities to bear by making those personal connections at this time. Um, because every candidate, whatever office they're running for, is compiling a platform and putting, you know, finger in the air and getting a sense for how popular it's going to be. Um, and it's, it's, it's way more common for people that are unhappy to speak up than it is for people that are happy. So making sure as you're happy about things you've seen on the streets that you're telling people that, right? Um, just so you're balancing out that tendency for elections to be dictated more by complainers than by people who have a vision and are for something. Um, How would individuals go about establishing those connections in addition to say going to community board meetings or I should say other than going to community board meetings? I would also love to hear actually if somebody for those audience members who might not even know what a community board meeting is, maybe we can start there. And then we can build on, okay, now you know what a community board meeting is and why you should get involved. And maybe we can then talk about other resources. I think, I think most places have some equivalent. Yeah. Um, so a community board and, you know, there's, there are community districts in this, in New York city. Um, so wherever you live, you have a designated community board. That community board is made up of unelected appointees. Um, the appointees are made either by a local council member or a borough president. Um, there's at least the last I heard and someone on the chat can correct me if I'm wrong, there's no term limits on those appointees. So you oftentimes have people sitting on a community board for a very long period of time. Um, there are subcommittees and transportation is one of the subcommittees of a community board. And so typically what happens if there's going to be, let's say a proposal to add a public plaza or uh, to change the curb from parking to a bus stop, uh, the Department of Transportation would go to the community board at hand, um, present the proposal, seek input from the committee and then the full board. And typically the boards have to vote to approve or not approve those projects. Um, and, and the interesting things about that dynamic is, um, you know, community board members oftentimes don't have expertise in the subject matter that they're listening to or hearing about. They're not elected, as I as I pointed out. Um, they're appointed, um, but it's but it is the place where a lot of projects go to either move forward or to get stopped in their tracks. And so, um, you know, if you if you want to get a sense for what's happening in your neighborhood, whether it's on transportation issues or sanitation issues or public safety issues, there are subcommittees on all those topics at the community board level. You can be a voting member of the public. Uh, you don't have to be a full-time uh, board member to be a part of those meetings. You could actually go to your council member tonight and ask if he or she will appoint you to the community board. That's, that's what people do. They get asked to be appointed. 
Transportation Alternatives, where I used to work, actually does a community board join up um, series where they give people information about the community board and they help uh, people fill out the paperwork and, and sort of move through that process, sort of help break it down. So, I mean, I think local political political clubs or other local avenues, um, you know, I don't have as much familiarity with those, but I know they're another way in which elected officials running or in office get a sense for what um, is of interest at a community level. Um, yeah, I mean, um, that, that's a good synopsis. Uh, Bike New York has a, a program or an initiative called Street Action Now in which we uh, work with residents within, uh, within the district, the community board district that he or she lives in. And we work with them to uh, implement some uh, positive street design and street changes. So, you know, um, I, uh, one of the uh, participants in the Street Now initiative, and, and then we'll uh, take some questions from the audience. Uh, she lives on Staten Island and uh, she attended her community board, uh, Staten Island Community Board one meeting, as a matter of fact. And uh, she said, look, um, this particular intersection is it, it's a problem in intersection for both pedestrians and cyclists. And uh, the chairperson of the transportation committee twice, he said, you know what, I agree with you. You know, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, and uh, she is working with the transportation uh, committee chair to work with the department of transportation and Bike New York is working with her to implement uh, some changes. So, you know, we've, we're um, very fortunate in that over the years, there has been um, a greater interest uh, in the public realm overall. And, uh, and, and there are so many groups and organizations that have been responsible uh, for that. And uh, we're uh, indebted to them. And, uh, taking the next step and, and having um, this type of initiative. I mean, it's, it's really uh, very fulfilling. So listen, you can uh, become involved in your uh, political uh, arena by going to your, uh, becoming a member of your Democratic club, of their Republican club, of their progressive uh, organizations. Uh, you can become uh, members of the community board. Uh, but I think the long and the short of it is that, hey, uh, just go out there and uh, participate, participate, participate. So we actually had a great question that came in from one of our participants. And this actually um, is going to bring it a, a little bit, uh, we were talking about sort of the big picture. This is more personal. Um, Carol asked, how has being a woman helped or hindered your bike advocacy or entrepreneurship? Which I thought was a great question. Um, Angela or, or Lisa, one of you. Um, for me personally, um, I'm, I'm somebody that's generally pretty technical. Um, my background is in health science, so I'm always critically thinking. And um, I think that a lot of times before I open my mouth, I may be discounted as not understanding. And I've had quite a few mechanics try to mansplain to me um, some of the basic mechanics of the bike. So, you know, that's, that was a little frustrating. Um, and one thing I seek to do is, you know, to ev to educate our membership on the basics of the bike, understanding the parts of the bike that they do, they should, so that um, you know when we're in these situations, we can all speak the same language. Because you know, at face value, they may not assume that we know what we're talking about, but we do. That's a perfect segue for Angela, who is a woman wrench 
Um, I would love to hear um, your experience in a sort of a typical, stereotypically male dominated uh, field and what that's been like. And also as an aside, we've had some questions from folks who are interested to know how do they find a women uh, mechanic in their areas or like, a, is there like a 311 for that? Um, we can create one. We can start that right now. Uh, but there isn't one that I know of uh, to, to answer that question off the bat. I believe that there might be actually a, a, face, a Facebook group, though, for those of you folks who are on Facebook, uh, you might check that out, uh, female wrenches or female bike mechanics. I think there's something on Facebook. Um, <clears throat> so being a wrench in a male-dominated industry was, uh, it was actually the bike shops would love to have more female wrenches and more female um, shop employees. Um, they realize that the benefit of it, they realize that there's a growing audience um, and they themselves, I found at least very welcoming um, in the field. What was discouraging though, is that those folks who came into the shop didn't quite know how to handle a female mechanic. And with, you know, as you can imagine, if I'm behind the service counter and a, and a fella's behind the service counter, most of the questions would be directed to the, to the fella. And that would be not only from uh, the, the men that walked in, but also the women. And that was particularly painful. Um, but I understood, and, it, and again, it, it comes to like representation and visibility. You know, we're not used to seeing, unfortunately, um, female mechanics um, in that, playing in that role. So uh, that was something that was really troubling and, and we've, we needed to work on that. And most of the times the fellows would say, well, she's available, she'll help you out. She's a, she's a mechanic too. And that's how we kind of got over it. And then we had, I had to work really hard at developing a relationship or or making myself look bigger, you know, like behind the counter, you know, opening up my chest and, you know, exerting some sort of presence that normally I wouldn't feel like I have to do to be noticed. So it was really interesting, but it, it all worked out in the end. I do think it's interesting. Um, Lisa's talking about sometimes walking into a bike shop and feeling uh, mansplained to you by the mechanics, mechanic, female mechanics are, having a similar experience from the customer. So it, you know, it, it um, is a multi-level problem. Um, Caroline, what has your experience been like as a woman in, in you know, first in advocacy and, and now um, with City Bike? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I've always, uh, I've always been drawn to parts of this work that fix the sort of systems level of the transportation problem. So, you know, I've talked a lot about the street and how we can make the street fair for the most vulnerable street users um, so that it's not the most sort of daring, bold and reckless among us that uh, have access to a daily bike ride. Um, I, I feel the same way about bike share. I think at its best bike share um, creates an open door for the possibility of a daily bike commute in ways that um, is more equitable um, than before City Bike existed. And we're always striving to make sure that as we expand, for example, our membership and ridership is reflective of the community we serve. So we work hard uh, to build strong community-based partnerships. Sorry for the background screaming, if you can hear it, community-based. This is life, this yeah. is life in the age of Zoom. We get it 100%. Um, for the, you know, the community-based leaders, you know, we. When we expanded, um, one of the neighborhoods we expanded into recently in New York City with City Bike, we did a community mural and we invited uh, local artists to do that mural with us. And we really work hard again to sort of represent the communities we serve. Um, you know, I think I, I, I mentioned the work that Laura's done on the management team at City Bike. I, in my, in my role, in my capacity as a hiring manager, I also strive to make sure that I'm empowering women and, and diverse perspectives to the extent that I'm able to, but it's, it's a challenging, challenging thing. And it's been difficult uh, many times to be a woman in a space that's very dominated by men, mostly white men, and to try to sort of also carry the work of equity and access um, in that context as well as a woman. Um, I think I've not always been the best ally, but I, I've 
made it a priority to focus on allyship in that way, because I think, look at, look at here, Lisa and Angela, the amazing work they're leading. Um, there's so many amazing women that work in, in bis- related to bicycles in some way or another. Sharon, I think we met at a community board meeting actually yeah. for the first time many, many yeah, years Yeah, we ago. did. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think, um, you know, representation matters and all of us in positions, uh, with the ability to empower and create more representation, I think we, I know we all feel um, that obligation and that and that sense of responsibility. So, um, thank you for putting this panel together. You know, it's great. Uh, it's great that you've done that. This has just been a uh, an amazing an amazing conversation. Um, on behalf of Bike New York, Angela, Lisa, and Caroline. Uh, we don't know how to thank you for the generosity of, of your time this evening. It, it, just thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, you've each had a phenomenal impact on the growing women's cycling community in this city. And your work and participation uh, in this conversation are both deeply appreciated. I hope everyone will uh, check uh, every, all three of the panelists' uh, websites. Uh, we're gonna try to put their links um, in the chat as well. Um, I want you to know also that uh, we have a, a gear fence uh, program. By the way, uh, Chantel, did you wanna talk about that a little bit? Absolutely, Sharon. I'm really happy to um, thank you. So uh, Gear Femmes is Bike New York's women's programming. Um, I will say our Learn to Ride classes are already majority women, I would say, but Gear Femmes is specifically geared towards geared <laughs> towards women. Um, everything from Learn to Ride to street skills and is really aimed at creating a community um, of, of women who ride, um, whether they know how to ride now or not. Um, I think that if you check the chat, there's a link to a little bit more information um, about, about Gear Femmes. Um, but Gear Femmes is one of many you know, programs you'll see um, around the city that is creating a community for, for women, uh, women who, who, who bike. I just want to thank our audience. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a lot of folks who are, who are still with us. And so that really is a testament uh, to the panelists and, and the conversation overall. overall. Uh, your attendance tonight means so much uh, to Bike New York and, and to us. Consider helping to sustain our uh, free bike education uh, program. Um, that's been our uh, heart and soul. It's, it's the mission of Bike New York. And um, any level of donation that you can make to Bike New York uh, means an awful lot uh, because it means that we're heading in the right direction and we're heading in the right direction with you. So. Um, thank you. Don't forget to, to go to our website, uh, to check uh, the chat, to, to donate. We really would appreciate that. And those funds um, help, uh, help to fund Gear Funds. It helps to fund our free education programming. So there are lots of folks who are in the city, whether they uh, grew up here or elsewhere, who don't know how to ride or want to get better at riding, especially now, as we know. Um, uh, so we want to keep providing those services. Um, uh, so yeah, and I have really treasured this discussion tonight. I know there's so much more that we didn't get a chance to cover that would you know go so so much deeper. Um, but let's continue this conversation. Um, if you're on social media, you can use the hashtag Spoke Series uh, and tag Bike New York at Bike New York. Uh, and also, if you're local to New York City, we've, um, we have a Women's Month ride coming up on March 28th called Women Who Built New York. And again, registration fees for those local rides like um, the Women Who Built New York uh, goes towards our free programming. Um, and you should check uh, the link for, uh, for our chat uh, and our chat. And as I said, um, check out our Gear Funds program. Our next book series is April the 19th. And that's Trails into the Future. Uh, we're hosting an exciting conversation about why the moment is now for the Empire State Trail, 
um, the East Coast Greenway, the Great American Trail, uh, Rail Trail, um, and also the Brooklyn Greenway. And um, until the next time, thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll see you April 19th. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody.